But today I have with me here Dr. Francesca Esposito, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the research she's been doing for the last number of years with women in immigration detention. And Francesca is really unique in that she's done research with women in detention in Italy and in Portugal and also in the UK. And so I invited her to come to do one of these videos of border criminology so that we could learn more about her research. So Francesca, could you give me a bit of an overview of some of the basic empirical context, like how many women are there in detention um, in Europe and what are the sorts of pathways and experiences that they have? Yeah. So first of all, thank you, Mary. I'm very happy to, I mean, to have the opportunity to have this interview with you and speak about my work. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, starting with your question, I think um, this is a very, it seems a simple question, but it's quite complicated to answer this question and say how many women are detained in Europe at the moment because uh, not all the countries have statistics available on this phenomenon because some countries just fail to record uh, this data. And so, and also because uh, not in all countries uh, in Europe we have like um, a common definition of what immigration detention is. So often, uh, I mean, in different countries, there are different kinds of facilities which are used to confine uh, um, non-citizens and migrant people. And at times they are not registered and defined as immigration detention facilities. Um, so, uh, for example, in Portugal, which, as you said, is one of the countries I, I mean, I, where I do my research, we don't have data available on how many people are entering detention. And the only information we have are information from reports of NGOs. Uh, that are engaged in this field and which obviously have a partial information and knowledge about the phenomenon. Um, and I think about this, it's also important to say uh, that there is a lack of information about immigration detention recorded at a European level. For example, there is this uh, um, Eurostat, which is the statistical office of the European Union and which has the task of provide um, statistics uh, in order to compare different European countries. And on uh, the Eurostat, we don't have statistics about immigration detention in particular. So we have statistics about uh, uh, people who were ordered to leave, people who were um, uh, recorded as uh, illegally present in Europe, um, re people who were refused entry at external borders, but we don't have specific statistics on immigration detention. And I think this is very uh, interesting from one side and also concerning from the other, because of course it creates a difficulty to monitor what is happening inside these institutions and also advocate for change. Uh, having said that, I think that we, I can reasonably say that overall the number of women in detention is less than the number of men. So, um, for example, uh, um, in, the, in the UK, um, Let's start with Italy. For example, in Italy in 2019, only 665 women were detained on a total of 6,173 people. So it corresponds more or less to the 11% of the detention population. Um, and these people were all detained in one detention center, which is the one I usually uh, go in, uh, which is Ponte Galari, Rome. And looking now at the UK detention context, in 2019, uh, there were a total of 24,443 people entering immigration detention. And again, the large majority of these people were male. So women were only the 14% of the UK detention population. 
Um, interestingly, in 2020, as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people were released from the detention, and we have already the data um, related to the first six months of 2020, so from January to June 2020, and only 600 for, uh, 640 women were detained. So I say only, of course, not because this is an acceptable number or a small number, but because it's uh, uh, significantly uh, less than this, the number of women detained in 2019. And also another interesting information, I think, is that the majority of women detained under immigration powers in the UK at the present are held in prison institutions. Um, of course, this is also worrisome because it's more difficult to get access to these women. Um, they are much more isolated and difficult to contact. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, as you were saying, statistics and numbers I think are important, but of course, uh, it's important to understand the stories behind these numbers. So you were asking me about experiences and pathways of women in detention, and I think it's particularly important to, um, to reflect on that. And I can say that many of the women I meet in detention are asylum seekers. And interestingly, interestingly in, in the UK, um, the, uh, more than half of uh, people entering detention are asylum seekers, according to uh, the last report of the Migration Observatory at the University of Oxford. Um, other women I met and meet in detention have overstayed their visa or were unable to renew their uh, residence permits. Uh, some women also come from prison institutions where often they have been confined for minor crimes, like for example, uh, offenses related to, to drug selling. And in Italy, also where citizenship law is uh, mainly based on the so-called sanguinis, so the right of blood. It was also very common to meet women who had uh, uh, arrived to Italy very early, at a very early age, or who were born and raised in Italy. And this is particularly common, for example, for in the case of Roma women. Um, I mean, notwithstanding the different backgrounds and pathways to detention, the majority of the women I meet and I speak with report experiences of gendered violence, which includes sexual, domestic, um, or reproductive violence, um, experiences that they suffered uh, in the countries of origin, in the countries of transit, and often in the countries of destination too. Um, in spite of this, uh, uh, their experiences are rarely acknowledged as a ground for protection. Um, and yeah, so... There, sorry, so is there, do the institutions vary very much or the practices? I mean, if, if you find, if you found that the women in the different, in the three different countries have had similar sorts of experiences and are perhaps there for similar kinds of immigration reasons, does the state treat them the same? Is the, is the detention centre in the UK the same as the one in, in Rome, for instance, or are they very different? Um, so there are definitely uh, similarities between the systems, uh, for example, in Italy, Portugal and the UK, which are the ones I know better. Um, for example, I mean, in, in all the three countries, I, I, I have to say that what I, what I witness is that detention uh, adversely affects the well-being of people in detention and that more of the people are confined and detained, uh, the longer are confined, uh, more they are, I mean, their mental health and well-being is affected. Um, there are um, some groups which are who are particularly at risk, like um, women uh, who have been victims of violence, children, uh, people victims of torture, or who have pre-existing mental and physical health problems. But also in the three countries, I think there is, and this is 
I mean, specifically for um, related to what I was saying, there is a lack of mechanisms to identify and address the need of women survivors of gender violence, and their rights are often not guaranteed. So, uh, all too often, uh, I find women, um, foreign women survivors of gender violence, including also human trafficking, uh, who are regarded uh, as merely illegal migrants and as such they are detained in order to be deported back to their countries of origin where they risk uh, again to be exposed to violence and even risk their lives. Um, in this regard I, I think it's important to mention the case of Ponte Galeria in Rome uh, in Italy where um, there is an association called Be Free, uh, a feminist NGO, uh, and they uh, work there in the center uh, since several years and their presence in the center, I think it's, um, it has allowed the development of some virtuous mechanisms. In fact, uh, I think it makes um, a very big difference when a woman in detention can meet and tell her story to a feminist advocate who has uh, an ad hoc training for dealing with cases of uh, gender violence rather than having to be interviewed by um, a frontline immigration officer who is not spe specifically trained on this issue. Issue. So uh, the work of Be Free inside Ponte Galeria consists in offering detained women psychological, social and above all legal assistance and this has allowed many women to be able to disclose their stories um, and also to get international protection or uh, to be recognized as trafficking survivors and so be released in the community. So I think for example this is a difference, something, I mean, a new, unique experience, and I think it would be also for them, both the UK and Portuguese systems to implement um, something similar. Also, um, of course, there are um, other differences. For example, um, in Portugal, uh, pregnant women um, and also minors and people with serious health conditions can still be detained and uh, asylum seekers lodging an application at a border post are also systematically detained and I think this is a serious problem. While in Italy, uh, for example, before uh, asylum seekers could not be detained, and it is only more recently with uh, uh, what has been called the um, uh, Decreto Salvini, the Law Decree on Immigration and um, Security, uh, which has introduced the possibility to detain the asylum seekers in special spaces within hotspots and uh, also governmental first reception centers in order to identify them. Um, also in Portugal, there is a big problem in terms of access to legal representations, especially in airport facilities. While, for example, in the UK, I think there is more for what I mean, I, I've understood from the interviews I've been doing, there is more a problem of quality of legal assistance provided. Um, so, for example, many women are just able to assess legal aid lawyers, and these lawyers seem to do not dedicate much time and energy to I mean, to support their cases. And the living conditions in both Italian and Portuguese detention centers are quite bad. So there is also a lack of provision of basic services like healthcare, the access of uh, uh, civil society groups is very limited. Um, this is especially true in Portugal where, for example, we don't even know the numbers of people in detention and nobody is basically, no external NGOs are able to, to enter. Uh, and even lawyers at times have difficulties to get in, in contact with uh, people detained in airport facilities. While, for example, in the UK, um, in general, uh, people, I think, are kept in better condition and often, for example, more activities, uh, but there is a big 
problem which has to do with the lack of a statutory upper time limit for detention. And these make things very difficult for people because we don't know how long we will be detained and we feel a lot of uncertainty and distress because, I mean, you don't know when, uh, I mean, how many time you will be there and what will happen to, to you. So that's why we are NGOs and activists are now advocating for a 20 days time limit to detention. Mm -hmm. Can I ask, you said... So I think... Sorry. Um, so you mentioned earlier on that, um, that under the pandemic there's been a significant reduction in, in people who are in detention in, in these three countries. Um, and I know that in the United Kingdom last week, for instance, there was just one, one woman who was in, in a detention centre. Um, and so you, you pointed out that, that there are other women who are being detained in prison under Immigration Act powers. But do you think that, do you think, I mean, what, what do you think it would take for the government here, perhaps, specifically to just sort of agree that they were going to stop detaining women altogether. I mean, they've closed down Yarswood or they've changed it into a different institution. So it's no longer a women's detention center. Um, and they seem to be holding between one and four women regularly in, in Colnbrook. And that, that seems to be it. Do you think that it's possible that, that this is actually the end to the detention of women in the United Kingdom? Um, or do you think it'll come back? I would like to think so. <laughs> I would like to think that, I mean, this really shows how, the, I mean, we can live without detention uh, um, of both men and women, because actually, I mean, we can implement alternatives if we really need to have some sort of border control and uh, you know immigration control we can implement community-based alternatives and we don't need to have these institutions which i mean have really high costs at financial um also human level but i'm not so optimistic unfortunately uh, so um, I don't know, uh, I think there is a really a um, high risk of things just getting back to the situation before the pandemic. Um, because this process has been happening, I mean, really not based uh, probably on the acknowledgement on the part of governments in the different countries that I mean that detention is a useful and that we can uh, end with detention and start to I don't know to rely on other alternatives but it has been based mainly on uh, healthcare concerns and this emergency situation and uh, and also actually if it's true that a lot of people were released from immigration detention facilities it is also true that in many countries for example Italy uh, a lot of in, um, unofficial forms of detention are proliferating so for example people who are landing on Italian shores they are being quarantined on on ships uh, and in I mean all sorts of facilities and this is not uh, considered detention officially but it is because people are deprived of their liberty and there are a lot of women and uh, so I mean, I don't know, I'm not so optimistic. I think it's really important to continue to monitor and advocate for ending detention, abolish detention, and find other, I mean, other possibilities to deal with migration and migration challenges. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and I think until we don't get to a point where really there is a decision made by government, uh, relying on, on the acknowledgement that we want, I mean, we need to end with detention, we want to end with, with this practice and, um, you know, adopt a different approach. Until then, I think there will always be the risk of, 
this uh, re reinventing of facilities and reusing them for different different purposes or using other uh, informal unofficial uh, facilities to to confine people and so yeah. in terms of that um la, you know in terms of that issue of trying to perhaps encourage governments to to end detention do you think that a focus on women is a is a strategic way of doing that 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 is there something um because you know I, i'm thinking here about that there's always been a strong strand of criminology on women in prison who have said which has sort of said well you know first of all the numbers are low secondly women in prison are vulnerable you know they're they're often victims of sexual assault they're be, they're often mothers so their their imprisonment affects their children you know let's let's treat women differently let's let's you know not put them in prison or put them in different kinds of prisons that are small and community based and perhaps open. And so there's always been a sort of feminist uh, exceptionalism, if you like, argument about women in prison where, where people, authors have tried to, to use women in prison as an example of, of a policy change that could quite easily be made um, and that should be made because they're women. Do you, do you feel like women in is, is feminist literature on women in detention ever like that? Is do you think, or do you think women in detention are a kind of easier case for the government to stop detaining than say men in in detention? Yeah, I do think so. Uh, I think uh, yeah, we. Um, I mean, as you were saying, we uh, can focus on on this group. Um, more easily try to prove that detention is not necessary. Of course, women in general are, uh, I mean, it's easier for people to feel a sort of empathy towards women, even because there is this um, basically mainstream um, discourse around women, which portray women as as this. So usually people feel more compassionate towards women. And I think we, I mean, although as a feminist, of course, I'm very critical about this representation of women. And that's why my research, I like to focus on women's agency and resistance um, protagonism, because I think it's really important um, on, on the other side, uh, I think we can kind of strategically use this because uh, it's probably easier to advocate with policymakers who are not really concerned about uh, uh, I mean, about uh, uh, about migrants and about uh, a human uh, migration system, uh, we can more easily advocate um, for ending detention for women rather than for men, because men are of course the other side of of the of the coin. Let's say it's that women are portrayed as victims, while women are constructed as dangerous. So that's how it functions. So I think strategically it, it can work, and I think we should, I mean, put our efforts on trying to advocate for this, while of course, I mean, always keeping in mind that this is strategic, but also the, the final goal, it's of course to end the tension for all the people, both men and women. Well, yes, because I suppose the danger of being strategic about women is that you then naturalize the detention of men. So you say, you know, let treat, treat women differently because they're not threatening, but by all means, go ahead and keep detaining men. So it seems, um, I mean, can you do feminist research on men in immigration detention? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I think I think you can do. I mean, in my PhD at the moment, my research it's more focused on it's focused on women, women's experiences of confinement in um, in Portugal, Italy, and the UK, as you mentioned. But in my PhD, I have been working on both women and men, and I think I mean. I was the same, so I was 
still, I still had the feminist approach to, to research, I guess. <laughs> so I, I think we can do that and it's important to do that. Um, and I think feminist research uh, has not to do with just focusing on women. It has more to do with how you uh, conduct your research. Um, what are, I mean, what is your research perspective, how you conceive research. So for example, for me, um, feminist research means, uh, uh, for example, acknowledging, uh, first of all, uh, um, the importance of, uh, of lived experiences. Um, also, uh, it has to do with uh, um, recognizing, uh, uh, of course, gender inequality, but also uh, other forms of inequalities and how uh, they play out in different ways in different contexts. So for example, how gender intersect with, with sexuality, but also race, ethnicity, class, ability and other structural determinants that shape people's experiences in context. And uh, uh, I think it's based on a methodological commitment to somehow document the links between social structures and how system affect and influence the lives of, of people, both men and women and also gender non-conforming people, um, and also how they make sense and resist these systems. So um, somehow bringing light to the political dimension also of people's lived experiences. And in doing that, I think it's important to acknowledge also our own uh, background, uh, subjectivity, um, positionality. So, for example, I think it's important for me to, um, to always acknowledge that I'm, uh, I'm a white woman with academic affiliation and with uh, uh, European citizenship who enter in a detention facility and establish form relationships with women who of course are in in much less privileged position and i think it's important this acknowledgement in order to be able to somehow create authentic um, relationships and relationships of, of trust when possible and also relationships uh, that for me are based on solidarity uh, but in in, in this way of conceiving, uh, I mean, uh, research and the approach to research means uh, um, like using my research to witness the struggle uh, of these women and also of these men, of these people I meet uh, and who are affected by border control and by detention. Um, and so also, I mean, as I said, focus on the agency or the protagonism uh, and not only on, of course, the violence they suffer and, and their suffering, and also to try to work with them rather, with, rather than on them. So I think also it, it involves a collaborative effort. So for example, in my research, I at the beginning, I tried to establish with this advisory board, community advisory board, uh, which uh, was composed of women with uh, experiences of detention. And of course, the same you can do with women and men. And I mean, it's uh, um, with all the people you work with. And it was in order for them to um, uh, discuss with me my research in terms of aims, the methodologies, the findings, the interpretations, what to do with the findings uh, uh, in terms of political recommendations. Um, and of course, I mean, recognizing the uh, expertise uh, based on the experiences. Um, and so for me, feminist research means uh, um, centering uh, people's lived experiences and their expertise um, and their protagonism and making space in our research agendas uh, and research projects to, for them to collaborate with us and to have resources and space uh, for their contribution to be acknowledged. Thank you.
I think that's a great place to, to, to finish, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much, Francesca. Thank you, Maddie.